Hello. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. It's a great crowd tonight. Um, I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer. I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's Hammer Forum on fracking and the Keystone Pipeline with Josh Fox, Bill McKibben, and moderated by Ian Masters. Ian is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of Background Briefing on Sundays at 11 a.m. and the Daily Briefing Mondays through Thursdays at 5 p.m., both on KPFK 90.7 FM. Ian has been a senior fellow at UCLA Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia, and all of you for coming tonight to hear from two activists who have gained national attention and, and have influenced the political debate in, the, in this election year. Notably absent on stage are representatives from the oil and gas industry, and that may seem to some as not being fair and balanced. But in the interest of fairness, who is really shaping public opinion on the pro and cons of the Keystone XL pipeline and hydraulic fracturing or fracking? Big oil and gas or little Bill and Josh? It is not even a competition when it comes to who is <laughs> It is not even a competition when it comes to who is spending millions on TV ad campaigns and who is relegated to alternative media, citizen activism, and grassroots organization. In choosing not to have a back and forth, he said, she said debate between David and Goliath, no one is assigning blame or re rewarding virtue. But since Time Magazine made the activist the person of the year, tonight we will learn about how a documentary filmmaker and an environmental activist overcame the extraordinary asymmetry in financial resources and political access to impact the national debate on our energy future and the direction of national policy towards our elusive and much promised energy independence. Surely everyone who watches TV and cable have seen ExxonMobil's TV campaign citing the need for the Keystone Pipeline and the oil and gas industry's TV campaigns about extracting natural gas from shale in an environmentally responsible way. What I find interesting is that the media buys for this advertising seem to focus on news and public affairs programs from the Sunday morning political talk shows to PBS's daily and weekly news analysis programs to the left's alternative to Fox News, MSNBC, whose top-rated show Hardball with Chris Matthews is sponsored by ExxonMobil. What may be chump chains to oil companies is clearly good for media companies, and while being a valued customer does not guarantee you favorable news coverage, the targeting of the liberal media does lead one to ask, why advertise on low-rated programs that news junkies and educated professionals with a liberal bias watch? The answer may be that we've already got the global warming deniers and the drill baby drill crowd, so why not preach, and so why preach to the converted, go after the atheists and the agnostics? And while we are endlessly told of investments being made in energy diversity and alternatives such as wind, solar, and nuclear, as consumers, it is difficult to see any real progress in the availability of alternative energy and the lessening of our dependence on foreign oil. Meanwhile, we are told that solar will be the energy of the future Apparently, it always will be the energy of the future. Then there is nuclear, still radioactive from the multiple meltdowns at Fukushima, and now, at least in the case of San Onofre to the south of us, in trouble again. This week, two decommissioned natural gas generators have just been brought back online to make up for the shortfall while they figure out what's wrong with that recently upgraded nuclear plant. If, as promised, we are to become the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, there is already an apparent glut in the natural gas market, so much so the leader in the field, Chesapeake Energy, might soon go broke as a victim of its own success. Of the available energy sources that could dramatically reduce pollution and global warming emissions immediately, none are cheaper and more abundant today than natural gas. Yet, unlike in other free market countries, American gas stations do not offer it, so you can't fill up your car with it for half the price and the vast fleets of, diesel, of dirty diesel trucks that could easily be converted to it still blow money and black smoke. This may not be what the two, our two guests want to talk about tonight, 
but it does make one ask why we need the tar sands oil and more natural gas if there is a glut in the natural gas market and the price is dropping through the floor. So why is it not readily available to the consumer who is feeling pain at the pump? And why are we not immediately seeing a difference in our energy use? Since there are no technical impediments, why are we not getting the payoff today from transitioning from the dirtiest to the less dirty while we work, wait, and hope for the clean? Josh Fox will speak first for about 15 minutes, then Bill McKibben. Then we'll have a discussion followed by an extensive Q&A with our audience. And after the forum, Bill McKibben will do a book signing in the lobby while Josh Fox entertains us with his banjo. We're going to do the banjo first. Okay. I'm not Joining complaining us. with Bill. <laughs> Joining us now is Josh Fox, a film director and environmental activist, best known for his Oscar-nominated 2010 documentary, Gasland, which first revealed the process of... <laughs> which first revealed the process of hydraulic fracturing or fracking. One of the most prominent public critics of hydraulic fracturing, he was arrested on February the 1st of this year during the US House of Representatives subcommittee hearing on hydraulic fracturing when he attempted to videotape, <laughs> when he attempted to videotape the public hearing. He is the founder of International Wow Company, a film and theater company committed to socially conscious themes and subjects. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Fox. Wonderful to be here in Los Angeles. Um, the oil and gas industry is not on the stage. Are there any members of the oil and gas industry in the audience? In the back row, perhaps, taking notes. Um, <laughs> if, you will, if you are, please um, identify yourselves. Uh, they were at the press conference this afternoon handing out flyers attacking my film. Um, so we know something interesting is happening when multi trillion dollar companies are handing out flyers at press conference rallies. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here in, in Los Angeles and I'm, I'm ex extremely unhappy about the circumstances. Um, you know, four years ago, um, April of 2008, I was offered a gas lease on my property, my family's property of 19 and a half acres in the upper Delaware River Basin in Pennsylvania, right on the border of Pennsylvania, New York, for hydraulic fracturing drilling for natural gas. And I quickly discovered that not only all of the Delaware River Basin, but the entire New York City watershed, and 50% of New York State, and 65% of Pennsylvania, half of Ohio, all of West Virginia, and 34 states throughout the United States was being leased, or the mineral rights were already owned, for this new thing called fracking for natural gas, which combines horizontal drilling techniques, drilling down very deep, and then laterally for up to a mile, or sometimes more than a mile, and injecting very high pressure liquids, a lot of water, two to seven million gallons of water per well, per frac, um, at very high pressures, in some cases 20,000 pounds per square inch, larger than a cluster bomb, infused with known carcinogens, neurotoxins, and a whole host of chemicals, some of which we understand and know, like formaldehyde, um, and others which are proprietary, are part of the Halliburton's special secret sauce that they will not release to the environment. I also found uh, to, to, to the public. I also found out that in 2005, the Congress, uh, pushed by Dick Cheney and his Energy Task Force, exempted hydraulic fracturing from the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, which meant they were not required to report the chemicals that they inject into the ground in enormous quantities throughout these 34 states in the United States to the EPA. So there is no chain of responsibility or liability when those chemicals turn up in someone's water supply. They can say, oh, we didn't use that chemical in that spot. That exemption today still stands. So I didn't know any of that when they were coming to me to lease in the Upper Delaware. Um, but some intrepid neighbors of mine, who then became the Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, um, had done research about it and did a little slideshow and showed me these moonscapes of Wyoming, which were pockmarked with wells, and that the West was getting completely wrecked. And I knew that someone was lying, because the natural gas industry coming in saying, you're going to make a lot of money, 
this process is perfectly environmentally safe. You're going to end up with what looks like a fire hydrant in the middle of a field. And then people talking about exemptions to our basic public health and safety laws put forward by a cast of characters, which I didn't think at that point were trustworthy, the Bush administration, and the gas companies. Um, and someone had to not be telling the truth. So I went across the United States and interviewed people in these gas drilling areas in the beginnings of the drilling in Pennsylvania. I found people whose towns had been completely overthrown, Halliburton trucks swarming everywhere, people could light their water on fire, children were getting sick, animals getting sick, noxious emissions into people's homes, completely lost uh, control of the basic um, quality of life issues of their town and of their human rights and of their uh, control over their own situation. And I found this story repeated again and again and again as I went to Colorado and Wyoming and Texas and New Mexico and Louisiana um, and then to Canada. Um, and this story replicates itself. Gas company comes in, all sweetness and light. You're going to make a lot of money. This is going to be great for jobs, great for the economy, American energy independence. And then you find a trail of absolute destruction in their, waste, in their wake. And outside of those shale gas drilling areas or these new unconventional gas drilling areas, the fracking areas, nobody really understands this. But then when it starts to come to town, you get it. And you start piecing it together. When I came to Los Angeles two years ago, before this was in the, in the news, before Food and Water Watch's report, California, here they come, we couldn't get arrested, unless I was with Bill. <laughs> <laughs> but we had t 10 people in the audience. And now you're, you're in this target zone, which is why I'm saying I'm unhappy about the circumstances today. You're in, ex in the position that I was in all those uh, four years ago. Happy to say we have staved that off in the Upper Delaware. We have staved it off so far in New York State. There's been moratorium. Um, but I'm happy to say that Andrew Cuomo has let that moratorium pass. And um, it's not clear. I think we need to get a conference call between Jerry Brown and Andrew Cuomo and us tonight on the phone. We can work it out. Um, because what's happening right now is an expansion of fossil fuel uh, and extreme energy in this form of fracking and other forms which Bill will probably talk about the last gasps of the fossil fuel era. Fracking could open up enormous amounts of carbon, natural gas, and oil to the world, which we can't afford. And apart from all of these incredible water contamination issues, air pollution issues, human rights issues, issues of democracy, because it is the, it is the same people who run these companies who are infusing millions and millions of dollars into our political system. That is a, a contamination of our basic democracy. When you have a gas industry paying $747 million, three quarters of a billion dollars, to lobby to get that Halliburton loophole, to get this exemption to the Safe Drinking Water Act, you can't compete. I can't compete. As citizens, we can't compete with that. That is a contamination of our democracy. But just in the brief opening here, I want to tell you that I got a call from Chris Payne, the amazing director of Who Killed the Electric Car and the Revenge of the Electric Car, and he said, they're fracking in Baldwin Hills. It's like over the, over the um, bend from me. There's a big public park over there. <laughs> so people are running around, and we literally walked off over this hill and saw on the hill this uh, lot of Halliburton trucks just this afternoon. We're going to put this in Gasland too, right? But this is on a major fault line. Fracking injects high pressure water into the ground. And in a central Arkansas, where they have injection wells and fracking going on, they had 1,000 earthquakes in a year. You can read about it in the New York Times. The first fracked well in England that was drilled, they had seismic activity immediately and shut it down. In Youngstown, Ohio, was it New Year's Day or New Year's Eve? New Year's Eve, they had an earthquake near the injection wells that disposed of the fracking fluid. There's a very clear link, USGS has reported on it, there have been a lot of reports on it, between fracking and earthquakes, and you're fracking on the fault line in Los Angeles. This needs to be looked into. <laughs> I don't know who to call, the earthquake hotline. There's a neighborhood watch in Baldwin Hills, there are all these signs in neighborhood watch. If you see any suspicious activity, I'm like, can you call the neighborhood watch and find, Halliburton is right over there, they're right over there. But I want to, this is serious. I'm not, I'm not joking. And I know it sounds a little bit crazy to say, oh, it causes earthquakes. You sound like you're wearing a tinfoil hat all of a sudden, which is why we didn't put it in the first movie. But it's real, and it's been documented, and it's not something that is actually um, 
a stretch. The science is very clear on this. So that's one threat. Another threat is you have this huge formation called the Monterey Shale, which runs throughout Central California, which they say holds, I think it's 60 or 70 percent of the whole shale oil resource in the United States. This could be an enormous oil rush and gas rush in, to California. And it's one that we can't afford. You can't afford it from a, from a standpoint of your bread basket and your water supply and your air quality. Um, and Bill will come on and talk about how this is going to be, this is total disaster in terms of climate change and moving towards fossil fuels. So I hope I get to come back to California, quite like LA. I've become a Lakers fan today because um, the Oklahoma City Thunder are in fact owned by Chesapeake, the largest gas company, or the second largest gas company in America. Seriously, the Chesapeake Arena, right? So get it together. You've got to beat them. You went down really bad last night. Call Kobe and tell him no, no fracking and beat those Oklahoma City Thunder. And just to finish, that kind of PR will continue to come your way. The Little League team on the Baldwin Hills field, their jerseys are sponsored by the oil company. So you have a little kid, Little League, playing in noxious fumes that we experienced today and gave us quite, you know, immediate headaches and nausea from being in the park. So this is the beginning of this, and I hope that it's, uh, fracking is also a gateway drug to your understanding of and action on climate change. Because it is a game changer. When you have people in 34 states threatened at the very basic level of their quality of life, of their homes, it starts to make a rumble. And it will, I believe, be one of the key things that will end our dependence on fossil fuels. It's not just your backyard. It's backyards in 34 states, huge areas. And I invite you to watch the film or go to gasolinemovie.com. We'll talk about it a little bit more. It's also happening in 30 countries worldwide. And this is not, we can't take this lying down. We have to organize, we have to mobilize, and we have to say, this is the absolute wrong direction. Because we had another type of energy spill today. We had a massive solar spill, which is otherwise known as a nice day. <laughs> and that's the future. Okay. Thank you. Joining us now is Bill McKibben, who is an American environmentalist and writer. In 2010, the Boston Globe called Bill McKibben probably the nation's leading environmentalist, and Time magazine described him as the world's best green journalist. In 2009, he led the organization of 350.org, which coordinated what Foreign Policy magazine called the largest ever global coordinated rally of any kind, with 5,200 simultaneous demonstrations in 181 countries. His books include The End of Nature, the Age of Missing Information, Hope, Human and Wild, and Deep Economy, The Wealth of Communities and the Durable Future. On August the 20th of 2011, Bill McKibben and 69 others were arrested in front of the White House for protesting the Keystone XL pipeline that would ship oil from the tar sands of Alberta to refineries in Texas. His latest book is Earth, <laughs> Making a Life on a Tough Planet copies of which we'll, Bill will be signing uh, after this event in the lobby. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill McKibben. Thank you. First of all, let me say what an incredible pleasure it is to be up with Josh, getting to talk. We've done this a few times in places around the country, and it, there's just really very few people that I admire more, and I have some sense of how hard he's working and how many places he's had to be. And... Um, um, and just what a kick in the teeth it was to find out he was going to have to come also and do this in California. You guys have got to um, get it together to stop this here, and it's completely possible to do. My home state of Vermont last week became the first state in the country to ban fracking. Um, and and uh, what I want to do for you just for a minute is kind of put his work in a little broader context. The problem here uh, is that, well, the problem here goes to the central problem of our time, which is this interlocked issue of energy and climate. We're running out of the easy energy to get at. Instead of taking that as a signal to make the transition to the sun and the wind the thing that anybody knows we have to do, instead, 
the fossil fuel industry has taken it as a signal to go find hard to get at hydrocarbons and so they're willing to literally break the world apart. That's what you do when you frack. You send a pipe bomb down that well and frack it. That's what it means. They go to the tar sands in Canada and, and, and rip apart the planet. I mean, you can see it on Google Earth. They've only got 3% of the oil so far out of there, but they've already moved more Earth than they did for the Suez Canal and the Great Wall of China and the 10 biggest dams on the planet, you know? And here's the thing. The real damage, bad as the damage is done close to home where all this is going on, the real damage happens when you start burning this stuff and when you change the atmosphere in ways that scientists have now told us is the most momentous thing we've ever done. I wrote the first book about climate change 23 long years ago now, in 1989. We knew then plenty to have taken action. We knew that when you burn coal and gas and oil, you put carbon in the atmosphere. And we knew that the molecular structure of carbon trapped heat that would otherwise radiate back out to space. And so the last 20 years have just been this process of watching this play out to the point where it's now remarkably obvious to people almost everywhere what's going on. So far, we've raised the temperature of the Earth a degree. Because warm air holds more water vapor than cold, it means that the atmosphere is about 4% wetter than it used to be. And in turn, that means that we're seeing epic doses of both drought and flood all over the planet. Okay? And well, I mean, in the lifetimes of everyone in this room, our Earth has left the Holocene, this 10,000 year period of benign climatic stability that underwrote the rise of human civilization, and we've moved into something else. And we're only at the beginning of that move. We've raised the temperature one degree, but the same scientists who told us that that would happen tell us that unless we get off coal and gas and oil very fast, much faster than anyone's planning to right now, that one degree will be four or five degrees, and the consequences just won't be possible to live with. Um, um, this is by far the biggest thing that human beings have ever done. And, and the reason that we're doing nothing about it, the reason that we have had a perfect bipartisan 20-year record in Washington of accomplishing nothing, okay, um, is the same reason, it's exactly the same reason that there were people out there, you know, outside Josh's press conference today from the oil industry. The financial might of that industry has been enough to muffle and, well, to warp our democracy and prevent any real action. The completely obvious by now imperative to act gets lost when it gets caught up in that kind of money. And we're never going to have enough money to beat them dollar for dollar. It's not possible. They have more money. I'm just a Sunday school teacher, but I mean, theologically speaking, I believe they have more money than God, you know? And, <laughs> and, and so we're not going to beat them that way. We're going to have to do it with other currencies. Passion, spirit, creativity, the currencies of movements. And so for the last four years, we've been trying very hard to make those movements finally happen. 350.org, which draws its odd name from what the scientists tell us is the most carbon we can safely have in the atmosphere, 350 parts per million, a number, sadly, that we're already well past. It's about 393. Right now, every place on Earth and rising about two parts per million per year, hence the drought, hence the flood. Um, 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 350.org has been trying with some success to kickstart that global movement. And I'm going to show you just a few images tonight to give you some sense of what that looks like. Since we're at a museum, I thought I'd start with, uh, I mean, we have many thousands of pictures on the Flickr account, but I thought I'd start with a few uh, from this big art project we did uh, a year ago. We wanted to draw attention to the scale of this issue, the fact that it's the first time that we've ever done anything that affects the whole planet. So we set artists to work getting uh, images uh, big enough that we could view them from outer space. Tom York of Radiohead got 3,000 of his followers to go to Brighton Beach and handed them all blue raincoats and they made that image of King Canute holding back the the flood, you know, and then 
thousands of people in Santo Domingo. Those are people fleeing a house against rising water. It's such a big image that it had to be taken from a satellite. That's all solar panels there, the yellow in, in, in Egypt. And that's a beautiful one. I just like that from Iceland. Uh, my favorite, though, was from the Santa Fe Art Institute, and that's a um, dry riverbed, and those are two or 3,000 people down in the riverbed with blue sheets, and at the moment that the satellite went over, they flipped them over their heads, and suddenly this river came to life. It was a gorgeous image. We do a lot of this kind of work, and we do a lot of kind of rallies and educational stuff, but it's not enough. We also have to hit harder than we've been hitting. And the last year, we've learned a little bit about that. That's what this Keystone Pipeline fight was about. It's incredibly important that we stop this uh, pipeline because uh, and, and the exploitation of the tar sands, because it's the second largest pool of carbon on Earth. If you could torch off all the oil in northern Alberta tonight, which I, you, thank God you can't, but if you could all at once, you'd raise the atmospheric concentration of CO2 to 540 parts per million, just like that, okay? So we asked people to come to Washington and get arrested, and, and people, including Josh and Josh's mother, uh, came and participated. It turned into, over two weeks, the largest civil disobedience action in, in 30 years in this country. Um, 1,253 people were, were arrested. Um, um, some of us, the first wave of us, got to spend uh, three days in central cell block in DC, which was as much fun as it sounds like it would be. Uh, uh, um, um, but the good news was that it didn't deter anybody, and people kept coming in huge numbers, and then it started to spread, and they had the biggest civil disobedience action they'd ever had on Parliament Hill in, in Canada. And then our friends all over the world started shutting down you know, embassies and consulates and things for the day, and it, it was pretty wonderful. Um, we followed the president around the country. We were very polite. Every place he went, people would be chanting, yes, we can stop the pipeline, you know? and and and. And then we circled the White House. Um, we didn't know if we could do it. Uh, we had my young crew on Google Earth trying to count how many people it would take. And it turned out we didn't need to worry. We had enough people show up that they were shoulder to shoulder, five deep uh, around this mile long perimeter. It was a beautiful day. And every sign that was there last November was just a quote from President Obama in 2008. You know, it's time to end the tyranny of oil. In my administration, the rise of the oceans will begin to slow and that sort of thing. And it, it was quite powerful. And in fact, four days later, the president said, OK, um, we're going to delay approval of this thing and take a longer look at it. Now, that was a temporary victory. All environmental victories are temporary. This one may be more temporary than most because big oil has poured now hundreds of millions of dollars into trying to reverse this. And your Senator Barbara Boxer is at the moment the sort of key person keeping them in the Congress from overturning the president's decision. And I hope you'll let her know that that's a good thing and she should keep it up, okay? Um, um, but the real point of all of this is we're not going to stop global warming one pipeline at a time, one coal mine at a time, one fracking well at a time. It's important to fight them all, and we will, but we also have to take on this industry more directly, get at the very kind of source of their legitimacy, make the point that now, at this point, what they're doing is, in essence, a kind of rogue operation. They are pouring carbon into the atmosphere, and it is having the most incredible effects on people all over the world. This last week, last weekend, weekend before last, uh, we did this thing around the planet, uh, fourth of these huge global days of action that we've done, but we called this one Connect the Dots, and we told people we wanted people to rally in places where they'd felt the sting of climate change already because we needed to put a human face on it. We needed to make people understand that these were not one-off tragedies someplace, but that there was a pattern here and that we have to desperately have to recognize it. The morning that we started, the f main fossil fuel front group, um, denier group, the Heartland Institute, put up that billboard in Chicago um, with Ted Kaczynski. Uh, it's not, if you think about it, a very logical 
you know, I mean, it's like, he's putting up a billboard to like Hitler wore pants or something, you know, I mean, I mean, it doesn't even, but clearly the message is anybody who would worry about climate change is a fanatic and a zealot and, you know, uh, uh, well, a serial killer, you know. And so we were very glad that within hours, these images were beginning to stream in from around the world and we could show people what the actual face of climate change was. The sun rises first in the far Pacific. So our friends in the Marshall Islands were holding an underwater demonstration on their dying coral reef, talking about the way that carbon emissions were killing them. And you know, uh, boy, I mean, there are other things going on in Afghanistan that people could be worried about, but that's the water supply for Kabul. That's it. It's at record low levels. And amidst all the other things that are going on, that's one of the very toughest there. Pictures like that just flowing in from every corner of the world. One reason to show you all of this is just to show you, those of you who do this work, who your brothers and sisters are. The old canard that environmentalism was something for rich white people who'd taken care of their other problems and that if you had to worry where your next meal was coming from you wouldn't be an environmentalist. Nothing could be further from the truth. Most of the people we work with around the world are poor and black and brown and Asian and young because that's what most of the world is made up of. They care every bit as much about the future as anybody else, maybe more, because if you live someplace like that the future is bearing down on you harder than it is elsewhere. Our friends in New Zealand making a human seawall against the rising tide. Our friends in Aspen, where they had no snow this year, doing, you know, their downhill ski. Our friends in Bellingham, there are six coal ports, export ports, planned for the Pacific coast of the United States to take coal from the Powder River Basin and ship it off to Asia. The worst possible idea. And they're going to stop the one in Bellingham, I think. Um, um, we've been up there working hard, but it's a struggle. Jordan, the flow of the Jordan River may fall 80% in the course of this century uh, in a place that's already horribly water stressed. There are school kids making drops of water. There are forest fires in Russia. Those are a happy picture of kids in South Africa who planted a big community garden that day. But there's the Beka Valley of Lebanon. We're kind of used to thinking of it in terms of its connection to strife in that part of the world. But what kids there were thinking about is, you know, bike paths and things. And it was really Micronesia, um, um, a foot or two above sea level. That's the Dead Sea. The top of that balloon, 26 meters, is how much the Dead Sea has dropped since the 1960s, okay? Um, um, that picture, you know, it's not like a very big rally and it's not in an important place that anyone had ever heard of. And I actually had no idea how anybody even organized there in the middle of some place in India. But the little caption that came with it just said, all it said was, there is no water behind our dam, period, end, you know? Um, and from the Congo, and. Pakistan, where they had 20 million people out of their homes in floods in the last two years. So in Karachi, in the big city, they, you know, got in lifeboats and stuff to kind of demonstrate this. But out in the countryside, you know, in the most traditional and, and I mean, that's, you know, people connecting. They can't actually do anything about global warming because they don't burn any fossil fuel. All they can do is appeal to the rest of us to do something about it. That's up on the Dana Glacier in the Sierra. We just thought that, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West should have her say, too, you know, in this uh, thing. That's where I'm in that picture someplace. That's in Vermont, where we got hammered by Hurricane Irene, the biggest natural disaster in our state's history in the fall, just swept away half the state. Um, 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 in fact, there's that dot again. And if you look in the background, you can see fertile farm fields now just covered with sand and gravel. Uh, left over from those floods. It's a horror. Um, um, but exactly the same thing in Mongolia and exactly the same thing in Afghanistan and exactly the same thing in Kenya. And, and there's our friends in the Maldives. Highest point in the whole island. This are archipelagos about a meter and a half above sea level. That's a 5,000 year old culture. Their odds of becoming a 5,100 year old culture are pretty small, you know. That's our friends in British Columbia getting arrested, stopping one of those coal trains headed for the Pacific, you know, one of Warren Buffett's coal trains, the Burlington Northern. Um, um, your actions affect me. There's nothing they can do to stop global warming, but there's a lot that we can do to stop it. Um, 
Um, let me just end by saying that, well, let me tell you two stories about those arrests last summer because I think they illustrate two important points. One is that we're going to all need to do this together. When we sent out the letter asking people to come, uh, Wendell Berry and Naomi Klein and I and a few other people sent out this letter, one of the things I was worried about was that college kids would have to be the cannon fodder for all of this, you know. That's usually how it happens. And right now, in our economy, if you're 22, an arrest record's not really what you need, you know. And so we asked other, but, you know, one of the few privileges of growing older is past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you, you know? And, 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 and so it was great when it happened. We didn't ask those 1,253 people how old they were, because that would be rude. But we, we, we did ask them, who was president when you were born? And, and the two biggest cohorts came from the FDR and the Truman administrations, OK? So that was great. The other thing, and this is the sort of the most important in a sense, is we told people, um, you want to come get arrested, put on a necktie or wear a dress, okay? Not because, uh, you know, I'm from Vermont. We're not big on formal wear, but we wanted a way to say visually the most important part of all of this, which is none of the things that we are talking about here today are radical in any way, extreme or militant or anything else. All we're asking for is a planet that works a little bit like the one that we were born on to. What's radical and extreme and bizarre is to fracture the earth in order to try and get the last little bits of hydrocarbon out of it. What's radical is to work for an oil company. It's to get up every day and go to work to alter the chemical composition of the atmosphere. No human beings ever figured out a more radical thing to do than that. And so we have to figure out how to stop them. It's just that simple. It's not easy. In fact, it's the hardest thing human beings have ever done, probably. But it is that simple. We have to get off fossil fuel, and we have to do it very fast. And it's going to take a movement to do it. And you guys are the, you know, what the movement looks like, on, you know, um, for better and for worse. And I'm sorry to kind of lay the burden of it on you, but there it is. So thank you very much for being here tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. So, just just to, 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 so that I can understand um, the limited choices we have. The point I was trying to make was that uh, that I don't believe I don't believe the the game. I believe the game is rigged and it's very difficult to get to alternatives because they keep getting promised. So let's deal with with natural gas since since apparently there's a glut at the moment. Is there any other way to get it? Out of the soil without fracking, out of the, is there any way to extract it without fracking? Sure. I mean, we've been getting natural gas for a long time, but we're, so what's that's this idea? To run of, out. But what about the Saudi Arabia of natural gas? The only way to get there is to frack. Is that the deal? Oh, um, basically, what you're talking about is different formations now than have been drilled into in the past. So when you were drilling for gas in the past, you had a dome of gas inside of an anticline. You tapped it and it would come up because it's lighter than air. Now this is all trapped in the fissures in the rocks of the shales, right? So shales are tight sands or coal seams. Split them apart. And you have to break them apart. There is no way that those regions produce without doing that. Nature's trying to keep it all inside, you know? And <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's true of gas, of coal and, and oil too. I mean, all the kind of Beverly Hillbilly stuff is over. There's no more just like up comes the bubbling crude, you know. Unless you're um, 30,000 feet in, exactly. the, in the Gulf of Mexico. That's right. Um, which was the bad that was, idea. That was sort of Beverly Hillbillies, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah it was, it so, was, the, so there is, there's, e even though the only, the only available alternative that pollutes much less than coal and, and half of what gasoline does, it's not an alternative. Natural no. gas, it doesn't. But that's, this is one of the fallacies, okay? No. Yeah, in, in CO2 terms, you get less CO2 per BTU burning natural gas than you would coal. The trouble is that if you, that CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. CH4, methane, uh, is far more potent greenhouse gas molecule for molecule. So if any of it escapes in the course 
of the production process, it, if more than about 2% of it escapes in the course of the production process, it becomes more global warming intensive even than coal. And not surprisingly, when your method is to blow things apart mm -hmm. and make fractures and stuff, things tend to escape. The first paper on this came out earlier this year, paper in Nature from Colorado, a series of fracked fields in Colorado. And if I'm remembering correctly, Josh, it was about 4% of the methane was escaping unburned. Out well, it's of that not just field. that it escapes. When they drill these fracked wells at the beginning for the first three or four days, up to several weeks, they just flare the gas right off into the atmosphere. So that's actually not flaring. I mean, uh, they're just venting it off. Yeah. When they flare it, they're burning it. But they're actually um, venting it off. A lot of the well infrastructure is also leaking. So when you're talking about the pipelines going through major cities, there are gas leaks going on all throughout. There's a guy who charted this in Boston showing that there was um, a huge amount of gas leaking just from the infrastructure in the city. But here's the other part of this. Even if, even if you could get all that gas out without any of it leaking, we, we still can't go on burning it because even, the, even though it's better than coal, at this point, we're so close to the margin for how much more carbon we can put in the atmosphere. I mean, if you, the International Energy Association did this whole uh, scenario where we somehow magically got off coal by 2030, and, I mean, which is, you know, take a lot of work, and stopped burning, you know, like unconventional oil like tar sand stuff, and basically converted the whole planet to natural gas. And by the latter part of the century, the atmosphere was 660 parts per million CO2, you know, twice as much as we could have. We got it. We, there's no more like for a while people thought, oh, natural gas bridge to the future was the mm -hmm. sort of language that the industry used. It's not. I mean, it's a kind of rickety pier stretching out further into this lake of fossil fuels. If we're going to get to the future, forget the bridge, we're actually going to have to make the jump mm -hmm. to renewable energy. And it's possible to do. I mean, Josh just put together this amazing uh, document for the state of New York where this is a real live issue explaining how it was completely possible for the state of New York to, uh, uh, to make that transition uh, to renewable energy in the course of a decade. Um, and I gotta tell you guys, since I live in the Northeast, we actually have like a lot less sun than you have here, you know? Um, um, it's not about, I mean, look, yeah. This is the good news. Yeah, the good, the good exactly. news is that there's a solution. You can do it. You know, the, the question of the, the next film, which is forthcoming, the sequel to Gas on Gas Night 2, what I started out with is, all right, well, let's ask the question. If we completely say no to the gas industry and say we can't do this, are we just turning the lights off in the middle of the uh, operation in the hospital or in the hammer form or whatever? Um, but, in fact we can do this all another way. There's a brilliant professor named Mark Jacobson in Stanford who wrote the, a cover piece for Scientific American, which shows that you can get us there um, with the wind and the sun and, and hydropower and tidal, and he has a whole breakdown. Because the funny thing about the sun and the wind's relationship is wind power is actually a form of solar energy as well, because when the sun stops shining, the wind blows harder. So when it's dark, you you're, you're actually showing that there is a way to combine those two sources that get us to um, so a future without fossil fuel burning. And so here's the problem that keeps us from getting there. Well, that's what I want to get to, because I, 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 I'm trying to understand. The reason we never transition is that the status quo is so powerful politically. Well, yeah, and here's and so what I'm it's asking defending. you, how do you make this, this transition with, with this sure. ossified structure? So here's what you would need to do. You would need to put a price on carbon that reflects the damage it does in the atmosphere. The fossil fuel industry is the only industry on earth that gets to dump its waste out for free. If you run a restaurant, you know, in Westwood, you know, the cheapest thing you could do at the end of the day would be to just shovel all your garbage out in the middle of the street because, you know, not have to pay anybody to take it away. You'd make more money. The trouble is there would soon be rats and you would have, you know, leptospirosis. And so we don't let people do that. We, for a hundred years, we've said, take care of your waste. The only exception to this is the fossil fuel industry, which gets to pour the, by now, the most dangerous waste in the world out for nothing. And until that stops, you know, the, the, economic possibility of making these transitions, it'll be delayed and slowed and really hard. Mm -hmm. That's what the political battle is about. 
and they're going to defend it to the end because it's made them the most profitable. I mean, literally, you know, Exxon made more money last year than any company in the history of money. Okay, mm-hmm. they will defend that. That's why we're going to have to movement to stop it. And and you know, it's interesting. You don't think about dumping as dumping into the atmosphere because we were out in this Baldwin Hills uh, Park today, right? And we saw a picture that said, no dumping. <laughs> and there was a dump truck. And then right across that was a big sign that said, there are chemicals on this site that are known to the state of California to cause cancer. And a stack on the top of the uh, big, huge oil and gas tank that was right on top of the hill. And then next to it was a sign that said, no bottle rockets and no golf. That, because they're hazardous. Not kidding. Literally on two, 12 feet apart. And we don't think about dumping as dumping into the atmosphere. But those wells are dumping directly into the atmosphere, and we're breathing it in, and we could smell it, and we know that. So you don't think about those in, in, that, in those terms. There's Absolutely. no dumping sign literally next to the one that said no model rockets, which was personally disappointing. But well, I read, I read the they piece. They tell Elon Musk. I, I read the James, you cannot do the, the James Hansen piece that, mm. where he, ca- he came up with that formula of taxing Exxon, for example, uh, and instead of giving them subsidies, which we do, believe it or not, and, and Obama was not able to stop the subsidies, um, the idea that you would tax Exxon Mobil uh, uh, is an extraordinary idea, but I can't ever see Exxon Mobil giving everybody a rebate. Uh, you can, the only thing you could do is do stop buying their product. Is, is it possible to stop buying their no. product? The answer is no, because what is the substitute? So They've kept is, the substitute off the market. That's my conundrum. No, yes. So the, the answer to that is we build the political movement strong enough to put the price on carbon, mm-hmm. at which point, you know, Exxon and everybody else figures out that their spreadsheet... You know, I mean, these guys are smart and talented. They're, you know, somewhat venal, but they're smart and talented. And, uh, and they'll be, you know, if they're forced to reconstitute themselves as energy companies instead of fossil fuel companies, you know, they'll, they'll be doing the work. I mean, Exxon spends $100 million a day exploring for more hydrocarbons. If they're, you know, if the set of regulations, the economic incentives were different, they'd be spending a hundred million dollars a day putting up solar panels, and we'd be getting somewhere. You know, we wouldn't be solved. This isn't. No one should walk away with the idea that this will be easy in any way. It will not be easy, but it is on the edge of doable. We also talk about a lot about personal responsibility, right? Which is this is not. I, I think you should spend five percent of your brain power getting better light bulbs, you know, and changing your light bulbs and changing your, you know, trying to get your personal thing in order and 95% of your time changing your politician. Because that's where the real change is going to come. Screw it's in, not just about what we can do individually. And in it, fact, must, it, what has to be done in, within the political and system. And in fact, at an even deeper level than that, changing your politician is important, but in fact, the, the new ones tend to be, uh, you know, we, we, need to, we need to actually be changing the kind of underlying system here, which we can do by taking these guys on quite directly. One of the things that we can do, and it's quite achievable uh, politically this year, uh, Bernie Sanders just introduced a bill last week that would strip the fossil fuel companies of their subsidies, their direct subsidies, not this most important subsidy that they get to pour out their waste for free, but at least the $110 billion we will pay them over the next decade, which even if they were, you know, it's like a performance bonus for destroying the planet, but even if they weren't destroying the planet, it's obnoxious. They're the richest industry on earth and we're giving them money. And what are we subsidizing? I mean, we learned how to burn coal 300 years ago. It's not like we've, there's like they're figuring out some neat new thing. They're just, and it's quite possible to mount that political campaign. In fact, if you go join us at 350.org, just sign up, you'll get the, uh, the sort of updates on how to do it. It's going to take a certain amount of shaming to make it happen. One of the things we think, we've decided, is that if you're, um, if you're going to be a congressperson and take money from the fossil fuel industry, then you should be proud of it, you know? There's no NASCAR drivers in blank suits, you know? Um, um, They put those sponsorship rights, so we're making up a lot of blue blazers, you know, carefully uh, 
outfitted with all the logos from Exxon and Chevron and everything else to hand these guys, uh, they should have to wear them to work if they're going to take the money. Uh, and I, I, I don't mean ch voting people out by changing your politics. In some cases, yes. But sometimes you also have to take some person who you think is, uh, is good and make them better. Exactly right. Make it a, a priority exactly for them right. that, you un that they understand that these issues are real and that they're coming directly to them now in the form of you contacting them and calling them. I mean, state representatives, state senators, um, not just our Absolutely. federal reps, but actually forming a relationship with those people um, who seem to be far away in some kind of television universe, um, spouting platitudes and things that politicians do, but they're actually people, and if you do reach out or protest or contact in one way or another, you can start to, to make issues priorities for people who and fracking um, is a super good it. place to start this process yeah. because everyone that you describe it to will recognize that it's delusional and bizarre to be in the middle of Los Angeles, you know, f fracturing the ground it's across a city, you know, uh, renowned the world over for its seismic, you know, potential. I mean... Um, I mean, it's, it's almost like a kind of it's like Saturday Night Live or something. I'm I mean, speechless. Just, I really am. I mean, New York is, you know, this was possible to stop the fracking in the New York City watershed. And we did that. I think it's as possible to go, oh, my God, we have an incredible public health nightmare in this part of Baldwin Hills. What are they doing um, allowing children to play in this place? Oh, and by the way, this could trigger a 7.4 earthquake that would be far beyond that one neighborhood. Um, what? Are you, I mean, it almost seems like a ridiculous thing. But this is just evidence, I think, of how arrogant and how bullying um, that industry is and how um, it was an act of hubris to go into the New York City watershed and say we're going to inject toxic chemicals by the uh, billion, millions and billions of gallons. It was an act of hubris to cross that line into the Delaware River, um, which got me involved and a lot of other people involved. This was them flying way close, too close to the sun. And it was also an act of desperation. Um, this is a moment where the fossil fuel industries could have said, oh, wow, we're running out of the easy to get stuff. Let's not do deep water drilling and imperil the poisoning of the, the Gulf of Mexico for generations. Let's not frack all these places where um, lots of people depend on groundwater. Let's not go into place, into Los Angeles and uh, bait earthquakes. Um, let's just start to make a transition to uh, something else. That would be a sane reaction. Um, instead, they've gone completely insane, in my opinion, and have done things that are ever riskier um, and much more dangerous. I mean, if you don't think that these companies are willing to risk a huge earthquake in Los Angeles, go down to the Gulf of Mexico and realize that the Gulf is uh, contaminated in terms of its food production and swimming and recreation, all these other things, for generations because of that oil spill and because of the toxic dispersants that they sprayed on the Gulf. We have lost the Gulf of Mexico for generations. I said to Wilma Subra, MacArthur Genius Award-winning chemist and first responder, what other motivation could there be what more motivation do we need to make a transition to renewable energy? And she goes, we lost the Gulf of Mexico as an ecosystem, but we didn't lose it as a place to produce oil and gas. And it will continue to be that until um, we can start to make that change. I found that like one of the most stunning, unbelievable things I've heard in doing this for several years, that now this is an oil and gas production facility, <laughs> no longer viable as a place just check to out, consume shrimp check or out food. Google or, Earth, yeah. look at the tar sands of Alberta for yeah, a moment, you know, and see what happens to a, you know, and, and you know, I've sort of kicked myself. I mean, the, you know, the, the people who live up there, the First Nations people up there in Alberta have actually been saying for a number of years, you guys should pay some attention to this. The trouble is there's 50 of these things going on at any given moment around the world. And it's like, how do you prioritize them? And so that's why, at a certain level, we've got to get to the heart of this problem, which is that, you know, that free ride that the fossil fuel industry has gotten, a ride they're now taking us all on, like it or not, you know. And, 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 
that's got to be the next step in this. But it's also always the moment when things change, right? When, when if you, you know, if we took a look at the Shakespearean point of view, right? The moment when the king has gone completely insane is the moment when it's, it's about to be yeah. over. And, and, but that takes a lot of effort, and usually there's a lot of, you know, uh, destruction that happens in the course of that, right? So, you know, I, 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 I want to make sure that this is not, I mean, I brought the banjo because it's a depressing conversation, okay? So we'll end with the banjo and everybody get cheered up a little bit. But, the, but I don't want to be completely, um, I don't want to go down a road where it starts to feel like, you know, just take me out. Now, I want to say this is actually the change moment and it is an amazing, amazing thing to witness. I mean, this Keystone XL, the largest civil disobedience. And it worked, uh, you know, and, at least for a little while. And f and f but and going around also from state to state, I've toured with the film, Gasland, to 200, 250 cities, something like this, in two years, um, and all over the United States and in 10 or uh, so other countries. And the film's been seen by 40 million people, a film that, at least, a film that made by two guys in the back of a car, you know what I mean, like... But the reason why it worked is not because, you know, I mean, it's a good movie. I think it's good. But the reason why it worked is that there are so many people in that target zone. You know, there are more than 50 million people in that immediate drilling target area, you know, who are going, oh, my God. You know, and when Elon Musk came out to introduce the new Tesla, the first I can't call it affordable, it's $50,000, but it's getting better, you know, and he came out, we have to figure out sustainable transportation or else we're going to get fracked. This is the first thing that he says. And it's true, you, 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 we've got to figure this out now or else we're going to get fracked. And when it's, when it's like that, and when you realize that it's your, my backyard in the upper Delaware is, is the same here as this, back, as this place here, as Bill so amazingly demonstrates with the 350 photographs, this is everybody's backyard, right? This is, the, this is what we're talking about here. Um, that there is that movement. It's incredible. I mean, it's unbelievable. To go to rural Pennsylvania, Williamsport, on a rainy Tuesday night, and 1,600 people turned out to see gasoline. I mean, I was like, what is happening right now? You know, and then that phenomenon keeps continuing in places which are more conservative politically. And you start to see these alliances happen. You start seeing people in Texas saying, we're, we used to vote Republican, now we're voting independent because we have no more property rights in Texas anymore. We have lost a basis of our conservative uh, politics. So you're seeing a change happening in unlikely places, and it has to start spreading. And We have to do this. Um, and I, I really, uh, you know, I'm incredibly grateful to Bill for leading the charge in so many ways in the most active way. So I think, you know, the thing that's most important is to just continue to show up and do those things. And if it means spending a couple hours in jail, okay. Not all of us spent three days. We were, I was there for like, you know, we were done for 45 minutes. And, but, of course, but in those 45 minutes, I was on vacation. I was like, there's nothing else I have to do right now. I don't have to pick up my Blackberry. I don't have to check my email. I don't have to return my text. I'm sorry, I'm in handcuff. Can't return your text now. They don't let you have. And it was like awesome. Email. I was like, yeah. "You're all right. Good. Keep me here because you know the phone ringing." Um, and that you feel like you've at that moment um, done everything you needed to do that day. <laughs> so, seriously, you know, you get <laughs> it's a free day from that moment on, right? Being in uh, that situation, so I would encourage it. It's like a bizarre, you could relate to this, it's very California, but bizarre kind of therapy. <laughs> well, let's, let's take some questions from the audience then. Uh, we have microphones on both sides, and uh, the lady here with a hand up right next to you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Brenna. First, I want to thank uh, Josh Fox, Bill McKibben, and uh, Ian, and the Hammering Museum for having this great event today. Thank you so much, and thanks for everyone that's coming out. Thank you. Um, my name is Brenna from the national nonprofit Food and Water Watch. Uh, we are a public interest consumer organization that works to protect our food and water supply. Um, I'm the new Southern California organizer for the Los Angeles office. Um, our office is right um, near Baldwin Hills, the oil field, and Culver City. Uh, food and Water Watch believes, like Josh and Bill, that there is no such thing as safe fracking. It's an inherently destructive technology. 
The science is there. Fracking causes water contamination. Fact. The EPA recently documented this nationally. Fracking is linked to air contamination, and as a variety of studies are linking it to acute and chronic health problems that live close to fracking sites. Fact. Fracking causes earthquakes. Fact. The U.S. Geological Survey officially made that connection just in the last few months. Fracking is a destructive technology. There's no way to do this safely. It's now, also can, can you ask a question? I love because I, oh, I, yes. I don't, I don't need a lecture. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that um, today I was with Josh and several statewide and community organizations and elected officials launching our statewide campaign to ban fracking in California. The regulation making its way through the legislature is not going to protect Californians. The oil industry is supporting that regulation. And we need, we need you to join with us. We need you to join us like Vermont, New York, and New Jersey and ban fracking in California. So please visit foodandwaterwatch.org slash California. Sign our petition and join our movement. We're going to need you. This is going to be a huge effort, and we can't do it alone. Is there, great, is there a sign up here? Uh, I do have a sign you up have here. sheets and, and stuff. Can you send them around the audience now? I do have petitions. Just yeah, send, send them around now. I'll, I'll send them around. And also the website is foodandwaterwatch.org slash California. You can find our reports and our petitions there. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And there are a lot of people here who are organizers about this in this area. I would say if you are one of those folks, you know, at the end of this, um, before the, or actually do it during the stampede to the book signing. Go to stand next to Bill at the book signing and just do. Bill will sign the book and you guys will sign the petition and sign up to. Is that the alternate forms of energy that we have, one, are not powerful enough to move transportation in the form of airplanes and all the rest of it, and two, we are at such a small point right now, ramping up to get solar energy. I mean, those big windmills take a lot of energy to build. Ramping up to that alternative energy is going to consume an awful lot of energy. That's one of the problems. How do we attack that one? I mean, it's a, it's a perfectly valid point. Um, people have done the calculations, and you know, it takes energy. It's what we should be spending our remaining fossil energy on is building the energy we'll then use, sources we'll then use for a long time. It doesn't come for free, but the energy payback time, if you build a solar panel now, I think is under two years, um, um, and its lifetime is well over a quarter century. Um, so the maths, I mean, there's no, you're quite right to point out that none of this is easy. This will be the hardest task we've ever undertaken. Fossil fuel is at the center of our economy, and it's hard to rip it out. The only task that will be considerably harder is living on the four or five degree warmer planet. Uh, uh, and, and so that's the, that's the only, I mean, that's the choice, unfortunately. I, one, you know, one gets to say, one of, one of the other privileges of growing older, if you one wrote a book about this a quarter century ago, is one gets to say, if only they'd listened when I, you know, said it the first time. I mean, you know, 25 or 30 years ago, we had the chance to make a more gradual uh, 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 on-ramp to this, and now it's going to have to be pretty abrupt, and that's a problem. Let me tell you what Lester Brown said, who wrote a book called Plan B, Plan B 2.0. He said, this, th we've done things like this before in the United States. You know, when, when uh, we're faced with the threat of fascism in Europe, FDR built from nothing this, the biggest uh, military the world ever seen in seven years. And they actually took the car factories and started building planes using them. Um, this is his words. Why can't we see this as a threat on that same level? Um, because when you're taking a look at what it could actually do and what it actually will do, it's a huge threat. So we can do this. In fact, it would really, really help us to do this. It would help our economy. It would put a lot of people back to work. Solar jobs um, are, are often union jobs. Gas industry jobs are not. Drilling jobs are transient. They are boom and bust economy. They're very, very unhealthy to take. So when you're talking about what, how to do this conversion process, what's really standing in the way? I mean, who's really making this? Money. Who's really running this economy? When they say to you that the, the renewable energy industry, the myth that, they, that it can't work, who's actually benefiting? 
In 2010, 93% of the new wealth created in 2010 went to the 1% in the entire United States. 93% of all new wealth created went to the 1%. Who's telling you, you can't do this? Where's the money going? You know? Thank you very much. My name is Gustavo Oliveira. I'm a PhD student of geography at UC Berkeley and UCLA. I'm also a member of UAW Local 2865. I have a two-part question. The first part is a reiteration of that gentleman's that I like to frame another way. Uh, I'm, I'm Brazilian, and uh, people in the United States, Western Europe, some parts of Brazil have a, a way of life that uh, I believe is just not something that is fair for people to try and sustain with renewable energies, while the problem, as you all point out, is, is much deeper. So I wonder whether and why not is it that um, that y'all aren't talking about degrowth, you know, to get away from the myth of growth. Mm. And so, the second point is that, uh, thank you both of, uh, for especially highlighting that this is a political issue and this is a threat to democracy as, as well as to uh, our more immediate material well-being uh, here and globally and such. Um, and you mentioned Senator Benny, Bernie Sanders and folks in Texas going independent. And my question is, is this not also the time for us to start talking about um, the radical political change that you say we need in terms of independence from these two parties altogether? Whether it's a new party, not just the Green Party, but maybe a different thing. In Brazil, we had a, a little problem that was a dictatorship. It was actually a two-party system imposed, you know, indirect elections. Sounds familiar. But what we did is we rewrote the Constitution, 1988. You know, is it not time for us to not just say in general, oh, we need, you know, fundamental political reform, we need to pressure the politicians, but actually say we need a new party, we need a new constitution. Make these things more concrete. If you agree, please do, do so now and also in your subsequent so, talks because you're influential people. So let's go to the first part of that question first because I think it's really key. It's quite, I mean, it's what I've written about in sort of my recent books a lot is this question of growth and... Um, um, and I think it's basically correct. I also think that it's fruitless to sort of, that, that it's not going to come by someone saying growth is a bad idea and here we have some other idea and here's how it's going to work. Here's how I think it happens. It strikes me that the move to renewable energy is a pretty dramatic act in this regard. Fossil fuel is... There's no, it's no accident that, you know, uh, Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations 30 years after James Watt invented the steam engine, not the other way around, okay? Fossil fuel underlies our idea of what modernity looks like. It's concentrated in a few places, it's easy to transport, and it leads to a kind of dramatic centralization of things and allows a kind of dramatic globalization of things. The... Um, Logic of renewable energy is almost exactly the opposite. It's diffuse but omnipresent. And as we move in its direction, we will see, uh, I think, an on, it's, it's kind of spur to an ongoing democratization of our society. Um, and I think that it's this. This goes to the second part of the question. The reason why I don't spend an immense amount of time worrying about who's running for president and who isn't and things is that I think the deeper Achilles heel of this system is precisely this question about fossil fuel, that that's where it's vulnerable, that its destruction of the planet is giving us this opportunity to move in really new directions, but that they're going to take not overcoming some particular politician or some political party, they're going to take overcoming the power of this most central industry to get something done. And when it happens, we begin to sense what this next world could look like. We begin to see it in a lot of places. We begin to see it in food, where the local food movement is a really interesting redistribution of power. It's still at its beginnings, and a price on carbon would help move it up overnight because industrial agriculture needs cheap oil. We begin to see it in the flow of information, where in the lifetimes of all of us, we've gone from a few centralized sources of information to an, uh, an internet very spread out with lots of everybody being sort of producer and consumer. That's what the energy future needs to look like too. 
what the engineers called distributed generation, uh, solar panels on every roof and them connected into sort of the big living grid that Josh was describing a minute ago. And so for me, the fight, the, the kind of fight about what we're going to call what political party and whatever is a kind of um, shadow boxing thing to keep us from getting at the real uh, heart of this problem. And, and so I don't, I mean, just for whatever reason, I don't want, I mean, I, just, I, I don't have the energy to like do the whole like, let's do the Ralph Nader thing again or whatever it is. I want to go deeper than that and fight harder than that. And I think given the timing that physics and chemistry dictate, we've got a few years to do that. So we better pick the absolute core, central, really root battles. And if we're going to have any the hope of doing it. Can I also, um, I love the way you're framing this. Uh, the, the distributed generation is a totally different model, right? We're probably, and I don't know for sure, I don't know if you've run this place off renewable energy, paying the oil and gas industry to have this conversation right now. Because the lights are on. Um, California gets 40% of its electricity from natural gas, the highest in the nation. So there's a problem with that. Um, and if we were to change those modes, so for example, this museum were to go and buy the oil fields and knock them down and put a huge community solar farm there and build <laughs> community solar, not rooftop. Not just because not everybody has a rooftop, right? Um, but you actually bought a share of that power and then you get off out of the equation. It's a community solution. And we build, I love this quote from the TED Talks from James Kunstler, the architect, this book, The Geography of Nowhere that he says, we're building a country so ugly it's not worth defending. <laughs> and the, the huge, he calls it the greatest misallocation of resources in the history of humanity, that, which is the strip mall. You know, the, the way that the, we, we have to drive. I mean, you don't if you're um, only in a very few circumstances, like if you're living in a place where you can walk to everything, or Brooklyn. you can, you're Brooklyn, I'm <laughs> sorry. But you know, um, Bill said it, not me, he's a Red Sox fan. Um, but you know, and, there are a few situations where you, you know, if you build the big Walmart instead of having the main street, you have to drive to get there and get back. And the main street is a better solution in terms of all the things. It's more street life. It's more alive. You actually can, there's a source of culture there. I think it's a, one of the most um, heavily uh, crime areas in the United States is the Walmart parking lot. Now, I'm not saying that big box stores and all those things can't work because there is a certain uh, efficiency and whatever to that model and some people love it and you know I'm sure at four o'clock in the morning and you need a hoodie and you're in Arkansas and <laughs> rock on go to Walmart but what I'm saying is that there are ways that this whole fossil fuel thing underlies the model and that as we start to change that you start to become of a different mind but um, another way of saying yeah. it is another way of saying it is you know, we learned, one of the phrases we learned in the last three or four years that was really important and we shouldn't forget was the phrase, too big to fail, okay? And it was applied to banks and it was applied to mean this is, uh, you know, we have to bail this out because otherwise we'd be bad. But really, if you think about it, what it means, you know, the, the, the simplest meaning of too big to fail is too big. Like, if something's too big to fail, we should make it smaller quickly so that if it, and, and that's what we have to do. It's not just our financial system that's like that. Our energy and agricultural systems are just as brittle and top-heavy and vulnerable, and we've got to figure out how to build them down quickly. And I think the root of that is this fossil fuel question. If we can get at it, we'll be making some real progress there. And, and if we are able to build these things and start building them, I think the quality of that experience will actually compete. Because we were talking about quality, right? Quality of life. You don't want to get stuck. We were on 405 for like an hour, right? Quality of life would might be b being on a train to get here, you know, or a quality experience of going and doing commerce or being a part of something. Do you know what I mean? Rather than this other thing, which is the economy, which seems to keep eating things and eating up space and, and creating something very unpleasant and, and not a quality jail experience. time, right? Mm. Hmm? We should all have a little more jail. No, it's not about jail. I'm talking about what are, we what are we building that's sustainable, and I think the sustainability of it actually creates a certain quality to it, too. Thank you, gentlemen and company. I have two mini statements and one short question. 
Uh, one is that we, in my opinion, need to consider with, when speaking about no growth, about Planned Parenthood. The second, and that's internationally. The second is that I just spoke to a filmmaker from Santa Barbara, where I live, and uh, Mark Manning, who has been shooting BP since it happened, just was down there a few days ago, and he said that uh, it's still leaking, and they are daily spraying the dispersants. And he got sick in a week. He had lesions on his arms. Um, my short question is, if you knew about Baldwin Hills, why didn't I hear about it? Our media, local media a little farther away, must know about it, and they're not talking about it. Well, maybe that'll change. Big um, press conference today that Josh has. So <laughs> well, keep your and I think crossed. the LA Times was there. Let's hope the editors run it, um, uh, whatever the story is. And I think it'll start to get some... I don't know. I think this is the reason to talk about it. This I'm, is new, why, I'm brand new to this today. This is why you Hill. build movements. That's yeah. what then draws attention to things, you know? Um, none of it, none of it's going to, I mean, if there's any lesson I've learned in the last little while, and I'm no, act, no great activist, I mean, I'm a writer by trade. This is not what I'm, you know, sort of set out to do. But one of the things that's become very clear to me is none of it comes for free, you know? Uh, if you want it done, then you have to go out and do it, and it is going to take a certain amount of work to, to make it happen. But I think it's also about telling, talking to the person who's sitting next to you at dinner. Absolutely. You know, um, and every once in a while, the person sitting next to you at dinner um, goes, hey, I've been talking about this to the person <laughs> next to me at dinner for a year. <laughs> you know, but you do that enough. You know what I mean? You, you have to start. The Gasland, okay, fine. A lot of people saw the movie. It was a project for my area. It was five-minute, ten-minute YouTube videos, or what we thought would be like that, for my area to educate people about the the fracking, so that we could stop it in the upper Delaware. You know, yes, we were aiming for and applied to get into Sundance when we didn't think we were going to get in. You know, when we did, it was a big, we had a big party. You know, and then we didn't think that it would get to be on HBO or that it would be sold in all these different countries. You know what I mean? That's the spiral. But it was really a, the focus of it was, oh man, we can't watch the upper Delaware get destroyed. We can't. We have to get to the people house to house and have something more compelling than their $5,000 to $7,000 an acre that they were going to pay people who were on the financial edge. And that was the way to fight it. So it was a local thing, you know, and I think that the Baldwin Hills probably started by a couple of, couple of people. Right. Um, the, these guys over here in the front row and gotten Food and Water Watch involved and then they start to do that. So you have to just... Uh, so my, I'm Saritha Peruri. I work in the biomass sector. So my question is, <clears throat> I go to a lot of these conferences, I speak a lot of these conferences, and I never really hear people talk about biomass. Biomass is the only um, scalable, proven form of baseload energy. It works when the wind's not blowing, when the sun's not shining. Um, it's the largest form of renewable energy in the country today, I think, the world. Um, and it creates long-term sustainable jobs that are local. Right? When, you're when you're using biomass, it's high yielding, like eucalyptus, willow, fast growing grasses. Um, you can turn that into power by dropping it right into a coal plant. You can turn it into fuel, plastics, chemicals. But I only ever hear people talk about wind and solar. And these fast growing grasses and trees are the most efficient solar panel on the planet, and you don't have to store it. So I'm wondering why I've never heard the word biomass in this panel and so many others. The, um yeah, it's, it's actually, it's a very good question. Um, at where I am in Vermont, the our college where I'm at put in a, one of the first big biomass burners in the country a few years ago. It's a very interesting technology, and you also have to be really careful with it. The key thing that you were talking about, Sarita, was the fast-growing part. Um, if we start, what's happened in too many places is that we started cutting down trees uh, and chipping them for biomass, like trees that have been there a while. And the problem is you put a quick pulse of carbon into the atmosphere from burning it, and then the trees that regrow take 50 years to suck it back out, 
and we don't have that 50-year period. So when we do it, we have to do it with those fast-growing things. That's, if we're going to do it, that's pretty key. And happily, there is, uh, I, guess the, I guess part of it is that uh, it does scale, but you don't want it always to scale to kind of industrial scale things. Um, around the Northeast, there have been several big plans for giant industrial scale wood burning things that people have fought successfully because their carbon numbers didn't come anywhere close to working. It works much better as solar and everything else with lots and lots of small things where you can keep track of what it is you're growing and make sure you're doing it right. But it is really important work and especially in not just here, in, in other parts of the world too. So thank you can, for that Can work. I jump one thing here, too? I think I've been privy to a big debate going on between some people who liked the idea of biomass in limited quantities in New York, and other people who were like, no, it's burning, it's carbon emissions, it's no. Now, um, I don't know uh, where uh, exactly the... I, I, I fall in all of this. I, don't, I really honestly don't know enough about it. But I would like to say about biomass, I would like to mention something else with bio, which is biogas. All of you right now are making natural gas. All of you right now are making it. And some of you are releasing it. <laughs> you're, when you, every time you flush the toilet, you have a trap in your toilet. Why is the trap there? So that your toilet doesn't explode. You're making it. The sewage system is making it. The cow manure is making it. I went to this incredible dairy called Fiscalini cheese, great cheese, really good cheese, blue ribbon cheese. And they have um, the 1,500 cows, and they wash the manure down these um, little troughs, and they create it in a big shit lagoon and a waterfall of manure. And that is bubbling off methane that they collect and put into a pipe, and then they burn it in their uh, in, a, in a generator that powers 900 homes and the entire dairy. They're completely off the grid. And now, no matter, you might not like the fact that they're dairy and the cows and the whole nine yards, but the truth is, you are all making gas right now. And you could harvest the gas in your water treatment plants and harvest the gas that's coming from the sewer, sewage system. And I asked Chesapeake, I went and I was talking in Kansas City, I said, you guys don't have to stop being a gas company. People like cooking with gas and so on. Just, just stop the drilling part. Just stop the drilling part. Just harvest it. Methane is a weird fossil fuel. We all make it all the time. And so does most biological material. You could be collecting that. And then when you're burning the methane that would be occurring from those processes, you're, you're actually dump, dumping it down a step. Now, I'm not saying that's perfect and you don't want to do that forever. We should all become vegans and no one should ever have a pizza ever again. But I'm kidding. I'm half Italian. What I'm saying is that I want cheese sometimes. But what I'm saying is we're wasting this enormous amount of methane and shooting it up into the atmosphere. And beef production, because of this reason, is one of the biggest causes of climate change. Um, and uh, that, those kinds of emissions, am I wrong? going into the atmosphere. And we could, and as you have done in California, be harvesting that and running, our, uh, running a lot of uh, power off of it. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Scott. Uh, how many people here run their homes on either solar energy or wind energy? Raise your hands, please. That's good. And how many of you um, in the audience drive an electric car today? Excellent. Um, electric cars are viable and they're affordable now. Solar energy in the uh, California area is now cheaper than grid electricity. Um, Ten years ago, I got my first solar panel uh, system. I run my house on solar. I got an electric car about the same time. So for the last 10 years, I've been driving on sunlight. My electric bill average is about $100 a year. I have not given the oil companies a dime. I've driven 105,000 miles on sunlight. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Now, I don't want people to think that you've got to burn natural gas for electricity for this. In 2010, according to the Edison Institute, because of the various federal and state and, um, efficiency programs, we saved 112 terawatt hours of energy. I can drive my car 400 billion miles on that much energy. 
which happens to be 13% of the total miles driven that year. And just in efficiency in one year, we saved enough energy to, to completely eliminate 13% of the total miles driven. So this is what we need to do. The people in this audience need to know the next car you drive, the next car you buy, should have a plug on it. Do not buy a new car unless it's got a plug on it. And immediately tomorrow, change, you know, call your utility and switch over to their renewable energy program. If your roof is viable, get a solar system and install it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, you know, this is also the solution for those of us who love to drive. You know, I, I'm one of those people. Um, that is the winning life. You know what I mean? You want to think about the winners. The question here. Uh, and and we, we, we need you, California. We really need you to set an example. You know, it's a possibility here. You can reject this here. Don't let Vermont overtake what could happen here in California? We, I feel sore coming from New York. Uh, you know, that, that Vermont so beat us to the point. So here's the real news, okay? Here's, here's what really should put us to change. I was in China last year doing a piece for the Geographic on energy in China. And of course, they made a lot of the same mistakes we did and burn a lot of coal, but they do a lot of things right, too. Uh, 250 million Chinese when they take a shower at night, the hot water is coming from solar thermal panels on the roof. There are cities where it's 80, 90, 98% penetration uh, of this stuff. 25% uh, altogether of Chinese uh, homes have this. In these, this country, that number is well under 1%, and most of that's used to heat swimming pools. And here's the real kicker. Uh, I spent the day with the head of uh, He Min Solar, the biggest of the solar energy companies, who's a very good engineer and now a very rich one. And, um, and he, um, he was telling me about his prize sort of possession. It's an old solar panel that he has in his private museum. You know where it came from? <laughs> it was one of the ones that Jimmy Carter put on the White House in... 1979, and Ronald Reagan took down in 1985 because he wanted, you know, manlier forms of energy than that. And, and it's, I mean, that's when I say that this is a political question in yeah. certain ways above all. There's the, there's the proof of it in a sense. And we've said over question and shown over little. and over again that this is totally doable. It's a political Go change ahead. that needs to happen. So, so there is a reason that Vermont went ahead first. They have Bill McKibben. <laughs> but uh, I want to tell you what's going on in, in California. I'm Andy Schrader from uh, LA City Councilman Paul Caret's office. We're actively interested in banning fracking in Los Angeles. Good. And, and just to let you know what one person can do, a grandmother from Chico decided that somebody should label genetically modified food, started a petition drive, collected 800,000 signatures, and on the ballot in November will be a ballot initiative asking the people of California if they want to label genetically modified food. One person. So what we need to do in Los Angeles to ban fracking, first of all, there is a question in this, we need all of you to come out. If this many people showed up and filled up the city council chambers for any issue, it would pass, guaranteed. The city council sees people in the seats, they will pass it, no matter what their feelings are. So show up for things that you care about and they will pass it. My question is, and we're looking into banning fracking in LA, what is our jurisdiction? I've been actively looking into this, can't figure out really who oversees it, how do we write that? Well, you know, there, there have been, I would point you in the direction of Doug Shields in Pittsburgh City Council, who drafted a, a ban fracking bill in City Council and got it passed through the majority of City Council, and the mayor had to sign it because it was veto-proof. Um, I, I don't know anywhere near enough about L.A. municipal government um, to tell you that, but I, but I could say get in touch with Doug so Shields. So far, local governments have a, had considerable yeah. ability to control this. Well, that ordinance was written places. by an organization called Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, or CELDEF, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. There's a roadmap there for a human rights-based structure 
of ban for banning fracking. And they have gone from town to town and town to town promoting that uh, way of getting rid of this. And they have had a lot of towns ban it in New York and Pennsylvania. Mine's very quick. Um, I'm Jessica Aldrich. I'm an organizer with Southern California Tar Sands Action. We had our Connect the Dots in Arcadia with the 100 Mile Winds that we had here recently. Mine is a favor that I want to ask you guys. There are a lot of organizations here today that are saying, please come out, support us, get on our list, come out, do these things. But then when we go home tonight, we've wrote these notes down, we may forget what those are. So 350.org, I'm on your mailing list, um, obviously, um, has a list that goes out to their members. So my favor is to say, if everyone in this room gets on the 350.org mailing list and I help you put together a list of all the organizations that are here tonight and other organizations in Southern California, will you send that out to your mailing list? Sure, we can, we, we actually are able now to sort of do this by zip codes and things and we can, yeah, make sure that we can help people communicate within particular areas. So absolutely. Thank you. I mean, I was just down last night and, you know, all the people from 350 San Diego had sort of things organized down there and, you know, on and on. It's, 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 technology is in this sense our friend, you know, and there's a lot of stuff we couldn't do even a few years ago. And, uh, and thank you very much for doing that kind of organizing. If people want to, I, I worry a little bit that we get, you know, that the nature of these things is to be a little uh, dispiriting and, and, and so on. Go home and look at some of the pictures that flowed in from this last weekend at 350.org and just, you know, um, allow yourself to understand the, 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 the fact that if we, if we were doing this by a kind of vote, you know, um, we'd win. Uh, uh, there are more people in the world who want the future than are committed to holding on to the present, you know? And, and, and that's really good, and they're really beautiful and strong and wonderful people. It's just that they're not at the moment have their hands on the levers of power, so we're gonna have to do a little bit of prying of those hands off uh, before we can start steering this thing in the direction it needs to go. Um, I just wanted to address the, you had asked about a mailing list. Um, for instance, I'm president of grassrootscoalition.org, and, dot org, um, grassroots coalition, and we've been working in the Los Angeles area for the past 20 years. Um, we are part of a mailing list that's private so that it doesn't get attacked a lot from the industry also, and on that we share um, technical reports and things with Back East. Um, so there is a lot of a communication ongoing between us. And I just wanted to give the audience a sense that these guys are new guys on the block for us. And it was a little hurtful for me to hear you say you came here and you, uh, 10 people showed up. Well, maybe that's because they didn't know Josh Fox. But we have been working here for many years. And we are interconnected in California on oil field gas issues. Um, the, and someone had said about fracking in Baldwin Hills. Actually, that's actually new for what's going on there. Theoretically, PXP wasn't going to be doing fracking there also, but there are still problems with oil field um, gas migration issues. And a lot of you are probably aware of 1985, the Fairfax explosion, Ross Dress for Less blew up, yeah. fire or through day. The man that discovered what happened with there was my mentor, got me involved in this, would not let me give up in this. He died recently being the matlock, going and climbing over fences and, and, and finding out about things like with Beverly Hills High School. We were involved in Belmont. We're involved at the Playa Vista site. We're involved with Southern California Gas Company's underground gas reservoir, which we have leaking issues. So I just wanted to leave with you all so that we are out there. And my organization certainly is um, tiny. So, 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 what's the website? Grassrootscoalition.org. You can also find us through savebiona.org. But we are out there, and, and we are looking to be with this, these guys and with Food and Water Watch to help us bring about a coalition. And okay. so we're very happy to have them here, and, and we thing. would like to work together. Amen. Well, so we're going to have a, a little bit of a musical... Uh, epilogue here and then we're going to go up into the foyer 
where Bill will be signing his books. So the conversation continue upstairs in the foyer. Go ahead. All right, so um, thank you very much. Thank you so much to the Hammer Forum. And um, what an amazing day today. And we'll just close by playing a short piece on the banjo um, popularized by my activist hero, Steve Martin. Um, and it's a piece based, uh, it's a medley that he did with a little other things working in, in there uh, of, on the Bonnie Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond, which is one of those Scottish locks that's incredibly beautiful, which is now at peril of being fracked. Um, okay, so here we go. Another adventure. 